Lord, we just thank you for this morning. And we thank you that, Lord, you always have something to say to us. And Lord, I pray that every heart will be open this morning to hear your word. Lord, I pray that we would go away encouraged. And Lord, I know that your heart's desire is that we go away blessed, Lord, and closer to you from this morning. So Lord, we just pray now that each one of us, myself included, Lord, would just receive from you this morning with an open heart and Holy Spirit, bring us revelation and help us to understand the truths in your word. Amen. Amen. So Celine spoke a couple of weeks ago on Believer's Authority and I encourage you to go back and listen over that because there's, there's loads and loads of scriptures that she brought that is really good. And I know I've listened to it again and, and it's, it's always good to go back and re-go re over the verses and with when John is speaking as well. You know, we shouldn't just come, listen to a sermon and then go home and say, oh, that's it till next week. Because we need to dig in and we need to meditate on the scriptures that's being given and we need to understand what God is saying. So, you know, just try, try and find time to have a look at it again and, and see what God is speaking to you through it. So, um, today I'm just going to look at um, authority and how Adam and Eve were given authority and they lost that through sin and then uh, how Jesus came and he used authority and how Jesus gave authority to his disciples and how the early church used authority and how um, believers have authority and it's the kind of authority that Jesus gives, that Jesus operated in, that was given to Adam and Eve right at the beginning. So, in Genesis 1, I will be repeating some of the scriptures that Celine brought, but in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them, and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. That was a word that God spoke, and when God speaks, his word is unchanging. Keep that in mind. In creating man, the sovereign of the universe makes a choice to delegate to man dominion on the earth. This was God's original intent for mankind, to rule in their God-given authority over the earth. And this dominion, or rule and authority, was something that Satan wanted. He didn't have anything, but he wanted what God had given to man. And so, he used lies and trickery because, like Celine said, he just couldn't go in there and take it off mankind. He had to use lies and trickery, tempting and deceiving Eve. <clears throat> in 1 Timothy 2 verse 14, it tells us that Adam wasn't deceived. Eve was deceived, but Adam wasn't deceived. And in a way, I think that's even worse because he, do, he took that fruit. And all I can think is that he loved Eve more than he loved God. And it's always um, a bad thing to put anyone or anyone, anything in God's place, to move God into second place. It always brings disastrous results. 
So Jesus was known as the Son of God, <clears throat> and this referred to his deity. He was also known as the Son of Man, and this referred to his humanity. So he was the God-Man, he was both God and man. Since God had given dominion of this earth to man, he had to become a man in order to get back that authority because he had given it to man and he, God is spirit and so he needed to become flesh to get back what Adam and Eve had lost. So in John 5 verse 26 and 27 this is what Jesus himself said for as the father has life in himself so he has granted the son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man so what jesus was saying here was it was his physical body as the son of man that gave him authority on the earth he could exercise authority on the earth because of his physical body and this all happened because God gave an unchanging word in Genesis 1 verse 26 to 28 and he gave dominion to mankind over the earth. So God is spirit and Jesus is God manifest in the flesh which is a great mystery but it does show the extent that God was willing to go to to redeem mankind and win back all that mankind had forfeited to Satan. Jesus is also known as the last Adam and he lived a sinless life unlike the first Adam. 1 John 3 verse 5 says, and you know that he, Jesus, was manifested, that means he appeared, to take away our sins and in him there is no sin. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22, talking about Jesus, it says, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. So Jesus was a sinless man operating under the authority of his father, and he did that willingly. Jesus did, did have a choice, he, but he chose to operate on, in this earth under the authority of his father so he willingly submitted to his father and also he had perfect and complete obedience to the father's will so whatever Jesus said and whatever Jesus did was the will of God he didn't add bits to that he didn't give his own opinion he didn't miss parts out of that, but he always did and said the Father's will. So if, if by, when we renew our minds in the word of God, we can know the will of God because his word is his will. And Jesus always did the Father's will. John 5 verse 19 says, Then Jesus answered and said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself because he willingly submitted to his Father. But what the, he sees the Father do, for whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. So Jesus was living as a man and he was living as man was always meant to live before sin entered the world. We must come under the Lordship of Jesus Christ to operate in the believer's authority in a godly way on the earth. We must come under his authority, not because we have to, but because we willingly want to do, just as Jesus willingly came under his father's authority, 
we are to be willing to come under Jesus' authority because he is Lord. Whether you want to bow the knee or not, he is Lord. But when we bow the, the knee to his lordship and we use his authority to do the Father's will as Jesus did, that's when we begin to see things happening. In James 4 verse 7 it says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, you, if when we submit to God, we are automatically resisting the devil. It's an automatic thing because you are sur surrendering to God. But if we, if we surrender or submit ourselves to the devil, then we are automatically resisting God. And we always must surrender, submit to God first. You can't resist the devil. It's impossible to resist the devil if you don't first submit to the Lordship of Jesus. You don't first bow the knee to him and have him as Lord. Satan will run you ragged. He will, he will bring temptation. He will cause all kinds of things, that you need, needless things that you don't have to go through, all because we're not willing to humble ourselves, bow, bow the knee, and have Jesus Lord of our life. Now, I believe that the centurion in Matthew 8, um, verses 5 to 10, recognized how authority worked and the power of the spoken word. He, the centurion came to Jesus and he had a sick servant and he asked Jesus, would you heal my servant? And Jesus said, yes, I'll come. I'll come to your house now and I'll heal your servant. And the centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having, and then I have soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled, and he said to all those who were following him, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. We will never walk in such faith that caused Jesus to marvel until we understand authority the way that the centurion understood authority. He came under authority, he had, a, he had superior officers over him, and then he would immediately obey the command he would give command to the soldiers under him and they would immediately obey command. And he could see Jesus had authority over the sickness that his servant was suffering with. And he, he understood exactly the authority and the power of the spoken word, the power of a spoken command. But we must, have un, we must be unwavering in our faith you can't be in two minds because if you're in doubt and unbelief and faith, now this can happen because there was a, um, an incident in the Bible where a man brought his son to Jesus to be healed and he, he, he said, Lord, I believe, but help thou my unbelief. When we have faith and we have unbelief it's like two opposing things they're pulling in the different direction so you can have faith but if you have doubt and unbelief at the same time they are pulling in different directions and nothing happens the healing doesn't happen the miracle doesn't happen because you've got two opposing forces pulling in different directions what the church does, it makes a mistake. The church begins to pray for more faith. That's not the problem. You have enough faith. Jesus said if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can shift a mountain. What the problem is, is our unbelief and our doubt. And we need to deal with that. 
You know, um, Smith Wigglesworth, he, he, he was a renowned plumber from Bradford, <laughs> and he operated in the authority of God and saw many powerful miracles. But that man would never have a newspaper in his house. He never, he never, I don't know if televisions were invented then, but he never had TV, he never had radio. He had the word of God. And that's why he operated in the faith, the level of faith that he operated in. Because he didn't entertain doubts and unbelief and other voices. And that seemed, might seem extre extreme, but he saw the dead race and he saw blind eyes open and he saw the lame walk. And you can disbelieve it if you want, but there is recorded proof of what Smith Wigglesworth did. And there are books written by the man, but not by the man, but about the man. So, you know, we, we need to understand it's the doubts and the unbelief that we need to sort out. So James 1 verse 6 to 8 says, But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like the wave of a sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord, he is double-minded and unstable in all his ways. So this was referring to asking God for wisdom. But this principle <coughs> applies not just for when we ask for wisdom, but Jesus said in Mark 11, verse 22, 23 and 24, For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. Now God isn't talking about, Jesus wasn't talking about going around and changing the landscape. A mountain could be cancer. A mountain could be a pandemic. A mountain could be anything that comes your way to steal from you, to kill or destroy. It can be anything like that. It's a mountain, something that's impossible to, to really move. And this is what Jesus was saying, if you don't doubt in your heart, if you deal with the doubts and the unbelief, and you come with that faith that he gives us, then we can do this. Matthew, um, Jesus was also noticed by other people the way that he spoke. In Matthew 7 verse 29, for he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. And there are endless accounts in the Bible where Jesus spoke to the storm and it obeyed. Jesus spoke and he commanded demons to come out of people and they obeyed. Jesus spoke and he cursed a fig tree and it died from the roots up. And he was showing us the command, the spoken word that is spoken in faith. Jesus commanded Lazarus to come out of the tomb after he'd been dead four days and Lazarus rose up from the dead and came out of the tomb. And so he spoke with authority. He wasn't begging or pleading, like we sometimes pray to God, begging and pleading God to do something, and he has already done it, and he has given us the authority to take what we have already been given in Christ. Hebrews 1 verse 3 says, and I've taken this from the Passion Translation, and it's a fantastic description of Jesus. The sun is the dazzling radiance of God's splendor. The exact expression of God's true nature. His mirror image. He holds the universe together and expands it by the mighty power of his spoken word. You're worried about global warming. I'll tell you who holds it all together. He holds it all together by the power of his spoken word. He accomplished for us the complete cleansing of sins. 
and then took his seat on the highest throne at the right hand of the majestic one. His word is so powerful, it holds things together. Even scientists can't understand why things just don't go poof, why they just don't blow apart. But Jesus holds everything together by the word of his power. He will never violate his word. He will never break a promise. He has established his word forever and it's forever established in heaven. It will never pass away. Heaven and earth may pass away, but his word will never pass away. He will not go back on something he has spoken. That's why Jesus had to come. God had to come in the flesh because in Genesis 1, verse 26 to 28, he gave man authority over the earth and man lost it through sin to Satan. And if Jesus, who holds everything together with his word, ever violated his word, think what that would do to the universe. It would just fall apart. So he will never go against his word. Remember how Jesus answered Philip's request when he said, show us the Father. And we've just read there that he's, he's exact mirror image of the Father. And Jesus answered Philip and he said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. You want to know what God looks like? Then have a read about Jesus. Look at Jesus, look at his character, look at what he did. You want to know the will of God about something, say about healing. Look at Jesus, look at what he did. He did the will of God perfectly. He never did anything except the will of God and he never spoke anything except the will of God. Look to Jesus if you want to know what God looks like. So you can be sure that anything Jesus did was the good, perfect and acceptable will of God. We see God's will in the living word which is Jesus. We see it in Jesus. We see his will in Jesus. We see it in his words. We see it in his action. That's God's will. That's God's will for mankind. We see it in the written word which is the Bible. Read your Bible because in there contains God's will. He operated with his God-given authority to do the Father's will on earth just as God had intended the first Adam to do. So in other words, Jesus was an example to us how to live abundantly under his authority and do the will of God, empowered by the Holy Spirit and using our God-given believer's authority to do all that he has told us to do, to do all that he has said we can do. This is how we do it. Not only that, he, the man Christ Jesus, came to give back to us what Adam had forfeited. I have to miss some of this, but... <laughs> 1 Corinthians 15, verse 21 to 22. For since by man came death, by man also the resurrection of the dead for as in Adam all die even so in Christ all shall be made alive what Adam lost when death came in Jesus came to give us life again Jesus came to set us free from sin and death Jesus came that we might have life and life abundantly not just in the sweet by and by <laughs> but here and now yeah in the mucky now <laughs> and so a thief has only one thing in mind this is what john 10:10, 10, 10, the passion translation says a thief has only one thing in mind he wants to steal slaughter and destroy that thief is satan that's who jesus is talking about he wants to steal, slaughter, and destroy. But I have come 
to give you everything in abundance, more than you expect, life in its fullness until you overflow. Not only that, 1 John 3 verse 8 tells us that he, Jesus, was made manifest on this earth to destroy the works of the devil and take back through his death the authority that Satan had tricked man out of and used against us. Revelation 1 verse 18, this is what Jesus says. I am he who lives and was dead and behold I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys. In the Bible keys are symbolic of authority. And I have the keys of hell and death. So for the Christian there is nothing to fear. For Jesus holds all authority. He's got the keys. He's got the keys. Not only that. In taking the keys of hell and death, Jesus stripped Satan of all his stolen power and authority. He stripped Satan of that. Now all Satan has is lies. He has his lies and he has his trickery. He's cunning. He's sly and he's good at lying. But we have the truth. And Celine said that last when she spoke, if we know the truth, we'll spot the lie. If we know what's real, we'll spot what's counterfeit. And so we have the truth. And if we know that truth, it will set us free. But if you leave your Bible on the shelf and you never read it, you not know the truth. So all the truth in that word will never set you free from fears and doubts and stuff like that because you're not picking it up and you're not taking it in. It's when we know the truth, that truth that we know sets us free because we spot the lie, we spot it straight away. Jesus then said, he went on to give back to believers this God-given authority. He gave authority to his disciples. He gave authority to all who believed those who are new creations in Christ by receiving Jesus as their Savior and Lord of their life. Jesus said this, the Great Commission, and Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18 to 20, he came and he spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore, therefore, Go therefore in that authority that is mine. Go therefore in my authority and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. The disciples operated in Jesus' authority in the authority that Jesus had given them. Matthew 10 verse 1, um, it says, Jesus called his 12 disciples together and gave them authority to cast out evil spirits, to heal every kind of disease and sickness and illness, and they did, they did it. And they were amazed that even the demons were subject to them. The early church operated in this authority, empowered by the Holy Spirit. In Acts 8 verse 7, this is all about the early church. Many evil spirits were cast out, screaming as they left their victims. And many who had been paralyzed, lame, were or lame were healed. And then in Acts 19 verse 12, it, many unusual miracles took place in Paul's life through Paul. When handkerchiefs or aprons were merely touching Paul's skin, and then placed onto sick people, they were healed of their diseases and evil spirits were expelled. In Acts 3 verse 9, 6 to 9, this is uh, the account of the lame man at the temple gate. And uh, Pete, the, he, Peter and John passed by and he was asking for money, he was begging for money. But Peter said to him, I don't have any silver or gold, but I'll give you what I have. 
I'll give you what I have. I've got authority over that sickness. I've got authority over that lameness. And this is what he said. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. And Peter took the lame man by the hand and he helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. And he jumped up and stood on his feet and began to walk. Then walking, leaping and praising God, he went into the temple with them. And all the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. Up to the present few days, up to the present day, sorry, there's very few out of the body of Christ that are really consistently operating in the believer's authority. I've mentioned Smith Wigglesworth, there was John G. Lake, George Jeffries, who began this the healing movement. There, and right up to the present day, there's only, there'd only been a few, but right now, there is more and more born again Christians knowing that it's not a super duper person that's got super duper faith who can do these super duper things. It's the body of Christ. They're recognizing that this is for the body of Christ. And so there's more and more now beginning to operate and seeing miracles and healings that are taking place on a regular basis. I can show you video after video where unsaved, unbelieving doctors give accounts of miracles taking place, yes, in 2021. It's happening. And you, get, you better believe it because you'll not hear it on the six o'clock news. Never. They will never tell you about the power of God on the six o'clock news. They'll just tell you how bad things are. And so there's a growing number realizing that Jesus' disciples are to act in authority. So Mark 16 verses 17 to 18, this is Jesus speaking, and he said, these signs will follow those who believe. Who? Who did Jesus say these signs will follow? Did Jesus say these signs will follow people like Smith Wigglesworth and these did Jesus say these signs will follow just the occasional one? Did Jesus say these signs will follow just a special few who specially anointed? No, Jesus did not say that. Jesus said these signs will follow those who believe in my name. And now he goes on to tell you the signs. In my name, that is in his authority, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. This isn't literally taking up snakes, although Paul did get bit by a snake and it didn't harm him and they were all expecting him to die. But this is speaking about the enemy, dealing with the enemy and the works of the enemy. He's, he's talking about that. And if you are a believer, Jesus wants you to operate in his authority. So it's not one special person. It's the body of Christ together in, the un in unity under the lordship of our Lord Jesus Christ, our living head. We, go, we need to go in the power of the Holy Spirit and use the authority that Jesus has given to all believers to do what Jesus did. And he has promised that most assuredly, in, in John 14, verse 12, most assuredly, he's emphasizing this. I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these will he do, because I go to my Father. So I think it's time to get serious with God. I really do. More and more, God is speaking to me about things. And I know that he's speaking to your hearts about things. It's time to start turning off the TV, getting out of your computer, putting down your iPhone, and it's, it's time to get serious with God. It's time to get out of Facebook and get your face in the book. 
<laughs> where are you going to get renewed? Where are you going to learn about the authority and the power that he has given us? And be watchful what you put into your minds. Guard your hearts, because out of your heart comes a wellspring of life. Remember the power that is in the tongue, your spoken word. Remember, speak the truth that you believe. Don't speak the facts, speak the truth. There's a difference between facts and truth. We're not saying that the world didn't tell us facts that are true to the natural man. What we're saying is there is a, a truth that supersedes those facts and that's what we are to put first. So if the, if the, the facts on the six o'clock news are contrary to what God says in his word, go with God's word every time. Go with his word every time and don't let the fear of man entrap you because they don't understand. Don't let the fear of man entrap you. Don't waver from God's word. Don't be double-minded. Stick to being spiritually minded. That simply means agreeing with God. And then you'll experience what it says in the Bible that you'll experience. Life and peace. Amen.